Welcome back, everybody, to our study through Revelation. Today we get back started on Act 2, which starts in Revelation chapter 12. Ken, it's good to see you again. I, I hear you're having some weather down there. Yeah, Hurricane Debbie is making a, an appearance here, so we're trying to let Debbie know she's not welcome. <laughs> well, hopefully we can make yeah. it through this recording without losing any power. That's the, that's the hope right now, yeah. <laughs> Well, we are starting in Act 2 today, as you said, and let me just kind of go over what that means. We've, we've gone over 11 chapters so far, and Act 1, we're going to call that uh, chapters 1 through 11, the focus is on Jesus, the bridegroom. And the focus is on, let, let me kind of go through what chapters 1 through 11 real quickly. We learn um, the encouragement and the warnings to the seven churches. We see that Jesus is high and lifted up. He's, he's on the throne. He's worthy to continue um, the, 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 the progress that we need for the, the unveiling of the prophecy of the redemption of mankind. In other words, he's the one that's worthy to continue the prophecies of the Old Testament. The scroll is being opened. The title deed to the universe, he's, he, op he opens and he owns this thing. And we see him in chapter 11, the, the kingdoms of our Lord, the kingdoms of the world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. The story really, Jimmy, is complete in chapter 11. And we see Jesus as the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and all of the kingdoms are becoming his. So really, we could end the story there, and it's a complete story. However, we have one more act, and that's going to be what we're starting today, chapters 20, 12 through 22. If, if the first act was on the, on the bridegroom, then the second act is the focus on the bride. In other words, because Jesus did this, what does that mean for us? And this is going to retell the same story, but from a different perspective. So we're in some ways going to start the story over again, but this time it'll be with the emphasis, emphasis of what does this mean for us? So if you can kind of get that in your head, then it will be much easier as we go through and start act, act two. Okay. One thing I want to clarify as we're going through is I want to remind everybody what the Bible is all about. So it, the Bible is all about, if you want to turn your Bibles real quickly to Genesis 3.15, it's, it is what the Bible is all about. This is the whole story, and this is a very familiar verse. Once we get to this verse right here, we see this play out the entire Bible. So you have Adam and Eve were created in, in the paradise of God. They have communion with him. And then, of course, they sin. Uh, the tempter, the serpent is there, and God is speaking to ser the serpent, and he says, I will put enmity between thee, that's Satan, and the woman, that's Eve. And he says, specifically between thy seed, that's Satan's seed, and her seed, that's Eve's seed. It, that is the production of the woman, the woman's seed, that is going to ultimately be Jesus Christ. It shall bruise thy head, and thou, Satan, shall bruise his, Jesus's heel. And what we see in this is we see in the prophecy in Genesis 3.15, is we have two lines of seeds, and this is the story of the whole Bible. So we have God's seed line that is going to come through the form of Eve and her line, and we see Satan's seed line, which will come in the form of all ungodly on the earth. This is the story of the Bible. And Jesus, uh, the Father here, is saying that he is going to make a division. The Bible, <clears throat> the word we read in the King James here is enmity. Enmity means a division. He's going to keep these two lines separate because it's going to be through the line of God, the godly line of Eve, that the redemption of mankind is going to come about. And one day he's telling him that of this line, this line, somebody's going to come. It's going to crush your head which is a, it says bruise your head, but really in the Hebrew, it has the idea of complete destruction. It will destroy you. Now, in the process, you're going to bruise his heel, but we can heal, heal from a bruised heel. And this is the imagery that's being spoken of here on the cross. So on the cross, 
the imagery that we hit in Genesis 3.15 is that Jesus basically stomps the head of Satan on the cross. And if you stomp on somebody's head, you're going to hurt your foot, but you, re- you can recover from a, a, a non-lethal uh, wound like that. But the one that you stepped on, especially if we're talking about a person, a snake. So on the cross, Jesus was hurt, but temporarily he healed from it three days later, whereas Satan was crushed and he was permanently destroyed. That took place at the cross. So this division here, this enmity has to be there so that mankind can be redeemed. This is the story of the whole Bible, and we're going to see this play out today in Revelation 12, because remember what we talked about, act number one is what Jesus accomplished, act number two is how does that involve us. So we're going to see this exact prophecy being spoken of throughout today. So let's go ahead and jump over to, uh, keeping this in mind, let's go ahead and jump over to Revelation and chapter 12 and begin our story. I've missed the whiteboard, I have to admit. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm glad that we have it. All righty. <laughs> the old whiteboard. Something to do, something to do. Kind of keeps yep. our attention a little bit. And, uh, okay, let's go ahead and begin in verse number one, and we'll start breaking this thing down. So here's the beginning, Jimmy, of Act 2. We're kicking this thing off All in right. verse number one. It's, the Bible says, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Now I will tell you that when I was a dispensationalist and a futurist, I actually took this to mean Israel. And that's as far as I went with this. And this is Israel. But remember, there are two segments to Israel. Remember, we have really two parts to Israel, right? We have, because remember, Paul said not, not all who are of, in Israel are of Israel. So we have this ethnic Israel. This is the people that were arguing with Jesus in John chapter 8. Remember, we're talking about two seed lines in Genesis 3.15. And so in John chapter 8, we have the descendants of Abraham arguing with Jesus that they're good because their bloodline is from Abraham. And Jesus makes a distinction here. If you remember in John 8, he says something along the lines of, you may be of the line of Abraham, but you're not children of Abraham. And they're kind of confused saying, well, if we're of the line of Abraham, of course we're of, we're the children of Abraham. Jesus's point was they're not in the spiritual covenant. They're not, they're, their spiritual status is not what Abraham's spiritual status was. They're, they're in Israel, but they're not of Israel. So there's a subset. Mm-hmm. And then you remember what he said in John uh, 8, um, 844. He says, ye are of your father. Do you remember? Yeah. The devil. Mm-hmm. The devil. So interestingly, in Genesis 315, neither one of those people have biological seed. Neither one do. But... The definition is found throughout the Bible that those that are not in covenant are considered the seed of the serpent. You're of your father, the devil. That's whose spiritual family you're in. Now, Eve doesn't carry seed either, but we find through this, we all of a sudden see the woman. So I'm going to go back and look at Genesis 3.15 again, because this is bringing the whole story full circle. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the, the woman. So here's the story. We've been waiting all this time to see the godly line of the woman, something produced from the woman that will come and crush the serpent's head. That's what we've been looking for. Now, we've seen a lot of strange things happen between that prophecy given and where we get to in Revelation 12, such as we know we see Pharaoh. He's intimidated by all the babies, (laughs) and he starts killing everybody to and under to make sure he... He murders. See, Satan thought Moses was him, but Moses is put into an ark of bulrushes and and put down the river and spared, and he didn't get to him. He didn't know which one was him. Then we get it. We we see a lot of these strange things happening. We get all of a sudden to the the birth of Christ. Same thing. We see Herod get intimidated by a baby who they all said, "This is the one. This is the one that's the king of the Jews." Can you imagine the president of the United States hearing that a baby is born who's the new president 
and he freaks out and he starts killing all the babies to make sure that that one doesn't take his spot in the office. I mean, it's just, it's just a bizarre thing, but we understand there's a bigger narrative at play. There's a scarlet thread, if we will, all the way from Genesis 3.15. So the longer narrative is that Satan is looking for the godly line to produce someone that's going to come and destroy him. So we see Herod start taking everyone out to and under once again, but now we see the story is recapitulated and Joseph and Mary take Jesus down to uh, Egypt now because remember Israel has become the new Egypt. They're fleeing Israel into Egypt now to stay safe and the story then repeats itself. Mm -hmm. We see strange things, Jimmy. We see Jesus on the Sea of Galilee and we see a storm come and we see that Jesus, very odd wording here, he rebukes rebukes the wind and the waves well you can't rebuke an inanimate object the word rebuke means righteously corrected jesus righteously corrects the wind and the waves and then he turns around and says after he says the peace be still yo ye little faith this is a faith issue he righteously corrects inanimate objects well he's asleep on a boat it's obvious who he is now we're on our way to the cross <laughs> Satan's trying to conjure up weather to take him out. All these strange things to not allow Satan uh, to be crushed to the cross by, by Christ. So here we see Jesus has successfully gone to the cross. He's crushed the head of the serpent at the cross. <clears throat> He's resurrected. And now here's the result. Remember, Act 1 is Jesus' accomplishments. Act 2 is what does that mean for the bride? So as soon as we get into Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 1, of course we see the woman. It's not just Israel, Jimmy. There is ethnic Israel that is of their father, the devil. So ethnic's not good enough. But we have a subset of Israel, and they are uh, in, in covenant Israel. They are godly Israel. And that is who we see high and lifted up in heaven in Revelation 12. We see the ones that have carried forward the, the godly line from Genesis chapter 3.15. The woman is a reference back to Genesis 3.15. I see the woman. Now her place is not on earth. Now she's been exalted into heaven because we are in Christ. When Christ resurrects and, and, and ascends in Acts chapter 1, we, the, the those that are in covenant with him, <clears throat> positionally are with him in heaven. So this is what we're seeing in verse number 1. We're starting off with this connection back to Genesis 3.15. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven the position is in heaven and it's, it's a woman clothed with the sun the moon under her feet and her had a crown of 12 stars now the imagery here if you've been following with us if you've been tracking with us in our study the imagery here will be very very easy to figure out first of all uh let me just go ahead and go through some verses uh and and, and kind of make our case here that the woman the woman represents all the faithful people from the time of Eve. The woman is like is like the new Eve. It's, it's the faithful all the way through with an emphasis on the women all the way from Eve caring about this prophecy. So the women is the faithful people of God. Let's go to uh, Isaiah chapter 26 and 16 through 18. Jimmy, if you don't mind reading for us, that's a huge help when you do that. I appreciate that. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them, like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery, is in pain, and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Great. And again in 54.5, Isaiah 54.5. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. So we see this, we see this husband relationship that the Father has with his faithful in covenant. So the woman is receiving the seed now, if we want to say it that way from Genesis 3.15, from her husband, which is, which is the father in this case. And then finally in John chapter 3 and verse 29. 
He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So we're seeing this theming all the way through of the bride and the bridegroom. So the woman here represents the bridegroom. Remember what I said in Acts chapter 2, that this is the faithful. The Acts chapter 2 is all about the bride portion. We saw the groom already do his all of his victory, and that's Christ himself in Act 1. Now Act 2, the focus is now going to be on the bride, and that's exactly what we're seeing here in the very first verse. Now the woman here, you'll notice in, in Revelation chapter 12, the woman is clothed with the sun. So this is like a garment over her, her garment. So we know that the sun, and we've already kind of gone over this in previous lessons, but the sun is the presence of Jesus. It's the presence of the Father. It even says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus is the glory of the Father. It means he is, imagine if the Father is a light bulb, once the Holy Spirit runs through there, it's like turning the electricity on. And once the light bulb lights up and is illuminated, that's like Jesus being manifest on the earth. It, it's not that the light bulb wasn't a light bulb before the power got turned on. It's that the light bulb was known to have been bright and illuminated <clears throat> once the power got to the light bulb. It didn't change the properties of the light bulb, but it was seen for what it was. And in Hebrews chapter 1, it says that Jesus is the brightness of the glory of God. So that means that God's glory was always intact, but it was turned on so we could see it once Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And so this is the, the woman now is identified with her husband. She's clothed with the sun. And so as we see all throughout the Mount of Transfiguration, that Jesus is like the sun, John chapter one, he's the light of the world. He's the light of men. He, <clears throat> he says he's the light of the world and so forth. So the woman is clothed with the sun, and of course she would be. Uh, these are some of the words that Jesus said. If you would, Jimmy, Matthew chapter five and verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And again in Isaiah 60 and verses one and two. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. So we have all of these prophecies saying that the light of the Lord will ultimately come upon Israel. And all, these prophecies are ultimately fulfilled in Christ. So it's no wonder that the bride of Christ would be clothed with the sun, clothed with uh, <clears throat> his glory. So that, that imagery, hopefully that makes sense to those that are watching. We could carry that on much longer, but I think that's sufficient for this. And then we see this very interesting phrase also that the moon is under her feet. Now we just have to simply do a little quick study here on moon, and I'm just going to narrow it down to one verse. Now the moon was given... The moon was given for understanding times and, and, and indications of seasons. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> Israel ran all of their feast days through the new moon. You know, when you see this new moon, I want you to do this and this and this and this. So let's go ahead and look at that in <clears throat> Psalm 104 and verse 19. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. So a very simple verse there that gets right to the chase. And we could see a lot of verses that have to do with this topic, but we'll just keep it really simple. He's appointed the moon for seasons. Remember, it's a time indicator connected to the ceremonial feasts in Israel. That's why the moon was there, to govern those things. Okay, so it, what is the phrase? It, it, not to interrupt you too much sure, here, fine. but it just, when I think about all these kind of things, and, and sometimes Missy and I, because like I, I've said many times, we read through Psalms and every morning, and we read a, a chapter, yeah. and there's so many times that, there, that whoever has written that, that that particular psalm talks about these kind of things, and uh, it's just it just makes me think about God just imagined, and mm -hmm. then it was you know He just spoke it, and then it was <clears throat> like the moon. Okay, you're going to be in charge <laughs> of all the seasons, <laughs> and the sun. You're going to do this, and yeah. the stars. You're going to be on this. You're going to be a, the whole thing just amazes me, and and not only everything you're saying, but to add one more facet to that, that those were all foreshadowings and symbols and pointing to and signs 
of the redemption of mankind. So we, we learn about in the Bible, yes, everything you're saying, and it's incredible. Plus, those were all done very specifically to point you towards the most crucial event in the world, which is Christ's birth, death, and resurrection, because it says in Revelation that he was slain, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> from the foundations of the world. So it's just incredible it's that, yes, everything you're saying is all planned. So we see the moon for times and for seasons of things, indications in the, in the Israel's history. When we see under her feet, maybe we could read that. Under her feet is Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23. He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So one of the definitions of under his feet, and of course this is also connected to uh, Psalm 110 as we've gone over so much, but under, <clears throat> under his feet, under her feet, under feet has the idea of authority. If, if somebody or something is under your feet, it means that you have conquered it, that you're, uh, you have authority over it. So let's put all this together here. Uh, well, let's do one more theming here and then we'll talk through and put it all together. We've already gone over stars a bunch, so I'm not going to belabor this point, but just as a reminder, what the stars are in Genesis chapter 39, so sorry, Genesis 37 and verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. I, I'm sure Joseph. Joseph's brothers were like, yay, there's another, there's <laughs> yeah. another dream. <laughs> they were so happy to hear it. They loved yeah. him so much. They were so, so <laughs> proud of him. No, they were furious with him. And they were, he was saying, isn't it great? Guess what I found out? You guys are going to worship me. And, and mom and dad are going to worship me also. Now, what Joseph was seeing in his dream was that he was going to be the one, because this is all connected to Genesis 3.15, you know, all of the stories that happen to be connected to Genesis 3.15, that's the Bible. You know, th there's going to be a division between uh, the serpent and the woman. And the woman is going to bring about a line. And that the one that she produces is going to crush the serpent. That's the story. And so you want to, how do we know who Joseph is? Well, it's simple. He's in that line. You know, how do we know who Ruth is? Simple. She's in that line. How do we know anything about King David? He's in, he, he, it's like this line from Genesis 3.15 blazes through the Bible, and whatever life it happens to pierce, those are the ones that we know about, as we just see like an arrow shooting through all the way from Eve all the way to Jesus. All of these stories have to do with Genesis 3.15, explaining how we get to Jesus, explaining how that is connected to Genesis 3.15, and that Jesus is going to crush the serpent. And because of that, he redeems mankind back again and puts us back in the state of paradise, just like we were prior to sin. That's the story. That's the whole story. And so here, Joseph is giving you know this news to his brothers and saying, hey, guys, I had a dream that 11 stars, the sun and the moon. Well, his brothers got it. They said, if you keep reading after that, they, they said, so do you think that you, you see the word obey and obeisance. You think that we're going to bow down and obey you, the 11 brothers. They understood, in other words, here's my point. They understood that the stars were the brothers. They understood that the, the, the sun and the moon were mom and dad. You think that we and mom and dad are going to bow down and, and obey you, worship you? So they got it. Now, that's just one example. And we've gone over stars before, so I won't belabor the point. But in the Bible, stars were a sign of government leaders. And so here we see these 11 brothers. Of course, this is, this is 11 of the 12 tribes. Of course, Joseph is the other one. And we saw in Revelation, it actually does use, I always have some, some smarty pants will say, ah, Joseph's not a tribe. Yes, he is. Uh, it says that in Revelation, the tribe of Joseph. It's just that we're used to that being broken down into two of a half tribe of Ephraim and a half tribe of Manasseh. But we see that these are the 12 tribes. The son of Jacob are these 12 tribes. So it's the 12 tribes of Jacob. His name's changed to Israel. This is the leadership of Israel, okay? And so we can follow that theming all the way through. But we've already gone over a lot of that, so I won't belabor that. So, Jimmy, now let's put all the pieces together. This is all familiar theming. 
nothing I don't think is groundbreaking so far. Let's go ahead and read verse 1 again with the theming, and I'll explain it very, very simply. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. Notice it's a very big difference from being on earth where Eve was. It's a woman that is faithful, godly Israel, specifically talking about the godly line of Eve all the way through the seed carriers. And she's now clothed with the presence of God. And all of the feast days, all of the reasons to keep track of time, all of the appointed times, she's conquered them. They're under her feet. All right? And, and upon her head, she's like crowned with the history of these 12s. Now we see in Revelation, we get a new 12, don't we? We have the 12 tribes of Israel in the past, and we're also sandwiching that between the other 12 apostles in the new covenant. And of course, that's 24, and we see this 24 surrounding the throne, worshiping Jesus as the center of our story. Jesus is the lamb. He's the center of the story of the two 12s. He's the center of the old covenant and of the new covenant, 12 and 12. And now we see she has these 12 crowns uh, of stars on top of her head. Now let's go on, verse number two. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So we're saying that the woman is every faithful woman along the biblical narrative, along the story of Genesis 3.15 to bring about the Messiah. And let's look at it, just a couple of these things. Luke chapter 1, if we could, in verses 51 through 55. He hath shewed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hopen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And to his seed, as he spoke to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So here we have in Isaiah chapter 7, one of, the, one of the stories I just, it's so hard for me to read. You have King Ahaz, and King Ahaz was confused in his spiritual walk, and the Lord was going to be gracious to him and said, I will increase your faith. Because, you know, today we increase our faith by getting our nose in the book, and hearing comes by the word of God, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But God came to King Ahaz and he says, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Can you imagine, Jimmy, if God came to you and said this? I'll tell you what. Ask of me a sign, anything, as high as the heavens, as low as the depths of the sea. Ask a sign, anything you want, and I'll be able to provide for you that sign to increase your faith. And God offered this to Ahaz. And you know what Ahaz did? He played the God card. Ahaz was so spiritual, he disobeyed God. He said, no, 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 I will not tempt the Lord my God. I'm not supposed to tempt him, so I won't take you up on your offer. It's unreal. He plays the God card to God. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're going through Matthew chapter 15 in our, um, in our study at church. And uh, same thing there. The, 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 the Pharisees are basically saying they're, they're going to, and God, Jesus calls them out on this. He flips the script. They're saying, how come you guys don't do ceremonial hand washing? How come your disciples don't do that? You, you are just going to ignore the traditions of men? This is at the beginning of Matthew 15. And Jesus says to them, so you love the traditions of men, huh? You love the traditions of the elders? Well, that's interesting. How come you disobey the commandments of God to obey the traditions of the elders? And he explains to them how. He says, it's, God's command is for you to honor your father and your mother to obey them and honor them. And you go to your parents and say, I would honor you, but I can't take care of you financially because I'm giving everything to God. And if I, if I didn't have to give everything to God, maybe I could take care of you, but I can't take care of you because I'm just giving all that I have to God. And Jesus says, you can't even obey God in taking care of your parents because you're playing that God card. I can't. I'm just too spiritual. I'm giving everything to God. 
There's not enough left in my life to take care of you too. And so Jesus calls people out on this. It's like, you know, I'd rather you obey, you know, kind of thing. So, so that's what we're seeing in Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14. And now what's the sign? The sign is that this virgin will conceive and you'll call his name Emmanuel. So we see, let's also go to Micah chapter four and verse number 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So we're seeing a theming here. We're seeing the theming of faithful woman, bride, and now the bride is expectant. And we see that this, there's, there's birth a birth happening, and there is pain happening. When Christ comes on the scene and the woman delivers Christ, then Christ then delivers his kingdom. And so we see these birth pains that Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. These birth pains are the beginning, not the end. Remember, we talked about this in our Matthew 24 study. This is not a death rattle. It's a birth pain. Something is happening. Something's being born. It's the birth of something small that will grow into something big. It's not the end. It's the beginning. And so what is it, what is it the beginning of? Well, it's the beginning of the body of Christ on earth. It's the beginning of Christ's church on earth. And so this is what we're seeing here in Revelation chapter 12. Remember, we, we're recapitulating the story. We're starting over again with the emphasis on the bride. So here we see the woman is now in heaven. She's no longer in the garden She's in heaven. It's sort of a new Eve, a, a symbolic new Eve that's giving birth to a new Adam. See, Jesus is, our, is the last Adam. So now we see the, the imagery of this, this mother of all living sort of woman Eve figure and giving birth to a new concept of Adam, the last Adam. So here we see there's a pain to be delivered, travailing to be delivered, and finally delivered in verse number two. Okay, let's go to verse three. There appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. Now, there are a total, if we're counting this, and I'll kind of remind us of this as we go through, but there are a total of three signs in heaven in this imagery and four on the earth in the second act. So um, should probably come as no surprise, there are a total of seven signs in act number two. Uh, but here we have three of them that are going to be in heaven. Now, the dragon, there's three characteristics just like the woman. We got three characteristics with the woman. Here's char the characteristics. Seven heads. What do we mean by seven heads? Well, seven heads, uh, you kill somebody with a, with a headshot. So uh, we could go into all of the, this super detailed imagery, but let's just keep it simple for our study. It just simply means this. It's resilient. This sort of uh, – this this dragon that we, we see – it's not an easy kill. Uh, in other words, if you have a monster coming towards you and you get a nice headshot, uh, then it's game over. But there's seven heads here. Which one do you aim for? Uh, if you get one, there's six more. Can the other six patch up the other seven? There's confusion of how much power and how difficult it is. It's not impossible to take out this, this dragon, but it's very difficult with as many heads as it has. Of course, of course the seven in the Bible is a number of, of, of completion or perfection. So here we see a sort of satanic deception of, of power or completion here. So we also see, uh, in addition to these seven heads, we also see uh, ten horns. Now, horns in the Bible are a picture of power and of strength. And there's ten of those on this this beast here. And then also we have the last characteristic is it has seven diadems. Now there are two Greek words for crown. One of them has to do with just being the crown and the other one has to do with taking a crown by force. This is that one. It's almost a stolen crown. And that's the word diadem here in the Greek. And he has seven of these stolen diadems. Uh, let's go ahead and look at just a couple of passages to understand this. Daniel chapter 7 and verses 3 through 7. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made 
stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second beast, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So we could take the time to go do a verse by verse through through Daniel because we could break all this down. But for the sake of our study today, just understand that this is um, in connection with the the other visions that Daniel has, and these are successive kingdoms. And so when you get to Rome, which is the fourth beast, the fourth image here, the fourth beast is Rome, and Rome is like a culmination of the other three beasts. You see characteristics of the other three beasts when we get to Rome. And Rome is the most fierce. And one of the descriptions of Rome is that we see the same thing here with the dragon, that there are 10 horns. Horns here represent different units of power. um, And we could go through and understand this. But the point is that the dragon has found its power in Rome. Rome is basically completely being used by the dragon here. It's the the choice of of offensive weapon. Now, if you've been following us, you know that's kind of interesting because God is also using Rome to accomplish his purpose. And and, And also, the Jews are using Rome to accomplish its purpose. Everyone thinks they're using Rome. That is the weapon. Imagine Rome is just a weapon. You know, there's a melee going on between Jesus and his followers and, and, and Satan and his followers, and they're picking up the closest weapon, which is Rome. And so, so the dragon has the characteristics of the weapon, which is Rome. So we can kind of uh, understand uh, that, that Rome is the one that is, is the driving force of the, of the weaponry here. When we go into Daniel a little bit more, the successive kingdoms will make a little bit more sense. But for now, just understand that the characteristics of Rome are the same offensive weapon characteristics of the, the, the dragon here because Satan's using Rome as the Jews out of covenant, the apostate Jews are also using Rome to get at to get at Jesus. Now, once Jesus ascends, he uses Rome and tells his followers to hightail it, and that gets into our Matthew 24 study. Mm. Let's go to John chapter 12 and verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Okay, Jimmy, Jesus is speaking here. I don't think his words are difficult. These are all pretty simple words. And this is the question that I get today. I get asked this all the time. People want to know, uh, is Satan really bound? Is, 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 are we really saying that, 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 that Satan's been defeated? What does that verse say? When is the time? Now, now. is the time. Now is the time. Jesus said he was at that time going to beat Satan. The Genesis 3.15 story, Jesus is announcing, I'm the one, I'm going to do this. Let's go to Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. What a direct connection to Genesis 3.15. You notice how now we're going to see Satan crushed. How do we see Satan crushed? Under feet. It's the same imagery as Genesis 3.15. And notice he uses the word shortly. Romans was written approximately 15 years before the destruction of the temple. Jesus uses the word now in John chapter 12. Paul uses the word shortly in Romans chapter 16. So what's going on here? Well, remember, in God's grace, as we've talked about before, between the old old covenant being ended in the upper room and and the new covenant being started like a baton being passed off in a race this baton passing in god's grace of the old covenant handing off to the new 
that baton passing lasted for 40 years in God's grace before finally the, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And so Paul says it's about to happen. Jesus says it's happening now. They're both right. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan was crushed. The Genesis 3.15 prophecy was accomplished at the cross where the seed of the woman crushed the head of the serpent. That had been fulfilled in Genesis 3.15. And then the entire book of Acts is the record of the growth of the gospel, warning people that the kingdom is here. It's, it's a different message than what Jesus and, and the John the Baptist were saying. They were saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, within arm's reach. That's not the message in Acts. No one's saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're saying the kingdom of heaven is here. Mm. The message is it's now. We're, we're in the kingdom. Yeah. And, and, and you better repent, man, because there's some stuff coming down the pike. It's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay, so... These uh, in, Gen in Revelation chapter 12 and verse number three, we see basically the imagery of the dragon, which is the same person as the serpent. So this is all tied to Genesis 3.15. And this dragon is opposing the progress of the woman giving birth to the son. So you see that? It's very simple. So you see the in-covenant people of God in verse number one, the in-covenant people have brought forth now in our timeline the delivery of the child. That is both Christ and his church, and it's opposed by Satan, who's kind of a defeated fo he's a, he's a He's a foe that's tough to be defeated with the same characteristics as Rome. That's what we have so far. Verse number four. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, <clears throat> Jimmy, I have done this before in when I'm teaching live in, 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 a, in an audience, and I always say this this way, so I'll say this to our, I'll say this to our, our uh, crowd here watching on, online. And, and I'll just say, I always, I don't want anybody to ever trick anybody, so I always say it this way. This is a trick question. This is a trick question. But here's the question. What percentage of the angels in heaven fell when Satan fell from heaven? What percentage? And I usually have hands go up all over the room and everybody knows the answer. So I always just have everybody answer at the same time so nobody is put on the spot. So I say, <laughs> let's all say it together. What percent, what fraction of angels fell uh, when, when Satan fell from heaven? Let's all say it together. Everybody says one third, right? Yeah. Everyone knows that answer. Yeah. My, qu my question is, how do you know that answer? Well, it says what it right here, in the Bible? Yeah, what passage in the Bible do you go to to learn that? And the answer is Revelation 12, 4. So here's my question. Do you see that in this verse? It says his tail, whose tail? That's the tail of the dragon, who we're identifying as Satan. Right. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Where does the term fallen angel appear in that? And, and, and furthermore, we already have a theming of stars going on in this chapter. Yeah. You can't break that. So what is the theming of the, we already, we already know who the stars are. The stars are identified over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible as the descendants of Abraham. So now you have the woman in heaven and you have 12 stars crowning her. That's an achievement for her. But then you see the dragon coming in and he's causing chaos in the cosmos. One of the things that he does is he takes a percentage. And by the way, a third is not a precise. These, a revelation is not done in precision numbers. It's, it's, to, it's to give you an imagery. It's to give you an idea. The idea of the one third is to say not a majority. Not a majority. It didn't ruin the story, but it caused a lot of chaos. Yeah. The stars here, I believe, and people can argue with this, and it's not a point of contention for me, but I can tell you one thing. This does not explicitly say fallen angels. The stars here are, I believe, the descendants of Abraham. And so here we have the dragon is <clears throat> doing his very best to mess up the program of the child being delivered through the faithful woman, and he's causing chaos. And he did his best, and he drew a third of the stars of heaven. And why? He says in verse number four, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered 
for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the woman is faithful in covenant, uh, Jews specific to the line of, of Eve, and he's ready to devour the child as soon as it's born. Because remember, it's prophesied, Genesis 3.15, that that child's going to crush his head. So he wants to devour the child before he can grow up to do that. This is a, this is a Satan, Genesis 3.15 thing going on, not an intergalactic angels thing going on. Okay, that's the whole flow of thought here from John. And so we, we must see these connections here. So um, <clears throat> look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 10. And just before you read that, uh, Jimmy, I'll just say that in the Hebrew mind, the stars represented national leadership. And I've already mentioned that with Genesis 37. But here's another example in Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 10. And it waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and stamped upon them. Now, I'll let people, and like I said, maybe one day we can do a verse by verse with Daniel 8. I know there's a lot there, and people have a lot of questions. But I will just say, I'll, I'll just come to my conclusion without really showing my work on this, and you can dive into this and ask questions if you'd like. But this is the story describing Antiochus Epiphanes, um, sometimes called Antiochus the Fourth. Now, this is this is prophesied to happen in Daniel chapter eight, and we actually see this play out in history in what we call the intertestamental period between the the old covenant, the Old Testament being completed in Malachi, and Matthew being written in, in the New Testament. This is the story of Antiochus Epiphany coming and and destroying the Israeli leadership, and he was like. He was like a thug kind of coming in and trying to accomplish his own desires and uh, without giving all the details from this because we will rabbit trail really hard because that's a really fascinating story of Antiochus. But this led to what we call in history the Maccabean Revolt, the Maccabean Revolt. So if you want to study Judas Maccabee and you want to understand all these kind of things, you can actually go into the original uh, 1611 King James Bible, they actually put in there in the Apocrypha, this is recorded in 2 Maccabees. So it's a historically accurate story. You can read in 2 Maccabees, it's just a history. That's why the King James translators placed it right there between the Testaments so you can understand what was going on. It's not considered inspired, it's not considered part of the canon or, or scripture, but it is historically relevant and it's important to know what this is. Now this led to the Maccabean Revolt which took on, I mean, talk about a David and Goliath story. There's no way they should have done any, had to be, be able to do anything to Antiochus Epiphanes. But they came out and started to defend the Lord, where all the others that had low spiritual faith, they all laid down and were like, okay, just kill us. This guy's like, no way, we've got the Lord on our side. And uh, you can go through and read that story. It's absolutely amazing. Mm. But this led to what the Jews now celebrate, Hanukkah. That's what right. that's what Hanukkah is in celebration of the, the the Maccabean revolt, and that's what's being talked about here in Daniel chapter eight. In fact, um, we actually see this in John chapter ten and verse twenty two. It's called the Feast of Dedication. Now, I've heard people state before that we should only take part of holidays. This is kind of like the big uh, hatred towards Christmas and so forth. We should only have holy days or holidays that are stated in the Bible to follow those feast days. Lots of reasons why I would disagree with that. One is that the moon is under the foot of the woman. We just read that, and that's a very common theme that Jesus is. You don't you don't need a sign for something that you're already a part of. Uh, if if you're trying to get to a location and you see on the freeway five more miles till this thing, you see a sign for it. You're not there yet. Three yeah. more miles, you're almost there. But when you're standing in the supermarket, you don't need the sign to tell you how to get to the supermarket. You're there. The sign, that's the feasts were signs for Christ. When he's there, you don't need the signs. That's a great way to explain that. I've never heard it that way. Because the moon is already under her feet. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love that. That that cleared yeah, up a lot for me. Good, good. You know, it's so funny. Everybody learns different. We'll just keep saying it in different angles and maybe yeah. one will. You know, I, I know that's how I learn. I'll hear something a hundred times and go, oh, I think I just finally understand what they're talking yeah, about. I'll, so, yeah, good. I'll get it. I'll get it eventually. <laughs> just keep saying it. And just keep saying no, it. No, no, no. That's the same with me. And so the reason I brought all that up is I've heard people say that we should only have the feast days that are in the Bible. Well, in John chapter ten and verse twenty-two, 
we see that Jesus comes to Israel during the Feast of Dedication. Now, the Feast of Dedication is the, is the Feast of Hanukkah, which is not in the Old Testament. So you'd have to say Jesus was there for a different reason. I mean, he was there to celebrate the Feast of Dedication. It was a cultural event not found in the Old Testament. Yeah. So people that come down real hard on that and say, you can't celebrate Christmas, that's not in the Old Testament feast. Lots of reasons that's wrong. But here's one example you could throw on the pile that Jesus came to celebrate the Maccabean revolt, Hanukkah, uh, in, in John chapter 10 and verse 22, Feast of Dedication. That's not found in the Old Testament because it happened in the intertestamental period. So anyways, I know it sounds like we're rabbit trailing, but really not because we're going from Gen Daniel chapter 8, verse 10. And, and that is what we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 12 in verse number four with the stars idea. So kind of putting all those together. Well, who, were, you know, who, there were, was, who were some of the hosts in that Daniel? In Daniel 8? Yeah. Let me go ahead, let me go ahead and turn there. Because it said he... It cast down some of the host and of the stars. So is that is that two different things, or is that just saying the same thing twice? Yeah. So there's there's so when when Antiochus Epiphanes comes in, is that your question about Antiochus? No, I'm just Daniel eight ten. So whatever this is in context of, because I off the top of my head, I don't know what's what what this is talking mm -hmm. about in Daniel eight. Is this prophesying the Antiochus period? Yes. Is it? Okay. Yeah, and, and it, the it there is Antiochus. Okay, you said that. So you it, said it, that. Yeah, and it cast down some of the hosts of the stars to the ground and, and stamped on them. If you go read what Antiochus did in Second Maccabees, it'll be crystal clear. He basically, what Antiochus did essentially is he, he desecrated the temple. So he put pig's blood everywhere and made it, he just was made a mockery of the temple. This is why. So he, this is why. That's why some people give him the credit for uh, what we read in Revelation, right? The the yes. uh, abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation. Yes, and it certainly was an abominable act. But the reason why we don't place the abomination of desolation with Antiochus, and I, I, like I said, don't wrap it too far. But was because it was not. It was. It was not. And I made this point in Matthew twenty four. It was not Israel that did it. It was somebody out of covenant. And the point is, somebody out of covenant, which Antiochus Epiphanes is not in covenant with God, somebody out of covenant cannot mm. do an abominable ceremonial act. Yeah, see, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, that's the point. It, you, you have to be in covenant with God to be an abomination to God in a ceremonial sense. He broke into the temple. He took pig's blood and splattered it everywhere. All it would take to correct that, it's not, it's not like God is uh, n not understanding. We're not dealing with a mystical force and he says, oh, there's pig's, pig's blood? I can't do anything with that. No, go get, go get a mop. Go, you know, go, go get some 409. Go get some Clorox. Yeah, or they had a, this pig, pig. It wasn't their fault, in other words. Yeah, he had a cleaning procedure laid out in the, uh, in the old right. covenant. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this wasn't an abominable act because it wasn't Israel that did it. The abominable, abominable act in Matthew 24 was that it was the Jews themselves that took over the temple. And then God's presence left the temple. So the abomination of desolation. Behold, I give to you your house desolate. That's, mm. that's the act. And yeah, that I was remember, made manifest. Yeah. I remember when you taught that in Matthew 24. That, that's another one of those. That's the first time I've heard it explained that way. And that makes... That's the first time it's made sense. <laughs> yeah, and the Antiochus Epiphanes Act was um, a foreshadowing of that, but mm -hmm. he wasn't in covenant, so he couldn't accomplish it to right. that extent. Right. So yeah, going back to that verse real quick, it, the, it is Antiochus, even the host of heavens, and it cast down, and notice it was some, because in 2 Maccabees, you're going to see Judas Maccabee and uh, the Maccabean revolt come up. A hammerhead, you'll read about historically if you go, you know, look up, you know, some historical documents. He had the nickname Hammerhead. He was a great, um, tough guy, you know, right, tough right, guy. right. So against all odds, came and fought back. So, all right, let's go ahead and head back to Revelation 12, although I enjoy Daniel, but we will never get through Revelation if we go there. <laughs> and the point, the point is, um, that there are two kinds of people waiting for the child. Okay. That's the whole point. You have those of the line of, of the seed of Satan in Genesis 315, ready to kill him as soon as he's there. 
But there's also the other lines. We see these two lines all the way through. And let's go ahead and read, Jim, if we could, Luke chapter 23 and verse 51. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. So here's an example. This is Joseph of Arimathea. This is the one that helped Jesus with the cross, if you remember that story. And notice it says here, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. He was in covenant. He was in covenant with God before Jesus was born. And when he saw Jesus, he said, there he is. And there yeah, was a he, transfer. Yeah, he's the one who had the uh, the uh, the new sepulcher, right, that Jesus was laid yep. in. Yeah. He, yeah. And so, um, yeah, Joseph of Arimathea is, is the, uh, the one that, yeah, Jesus was put into his, his sepulcher. I think I was starting to get confused with Simon the Siren. I apologize for that. My brain got that. But yeah, he was waiting for the kingdom. And um, he was the one that, um, that we see Jesus is, uh, we actually see that in, Je- in Isaiah 53 about him being buried um, with the wealthy. And then Luke chapter 2 and verse 25 And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Okay, so I'm going to draw a little bit on the board here to help make sense of, 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 I think, often misunderstood concepts. So I'm just going to draw a bucket here because I think it's just easier to understand. So let's talk about people being in covenant, being in this bucket for the sake of understanding it. Okay, so when people in the when people in the Old Testament are believing, this is let's just let's just put the cross of Christ. Uh, no, I'm going to put it a little further than that. So I'm going to draw something just before that. So let's put timeline wise. Let's put the cross of Christ over here. So in the in the Old Testament, Jimmy, if people are believing, remember it says in Romans chapter four, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted on him for righteousness. You're in covenant with God through through faith still. He believed God and it was counted in for righteousness. Now we understand they get into Christ. They get into a covenant with God. Let's just put them all in this bucket, okay? Now we know that it's the blood of Jesus retroactively that cleanses them. We understand that. But that hasn't happened yet. So they place their trust and belief in what God says, not in what Jesus he hasn't come yet. So we'll put it in this bucket. But when Jesus is on the scene, he says, all that the Father has given me, I will in no wise cast out. There's a new bucket. So the Father takes who's in covenant with him and transfers those that are in covenant to Jesus, the Son. All that the Father has given me. So there's a transfer of, of, uh, of covenant location. During the ministry of Christ, there's a transfer from those that are already in covenant with God in the Old Testament. So there's this really special generation that is alive during the transfer happening between being in covenant with God, and then God gives to the Son all these people, and Jesus says, I will in no wise cast out. So this is a really interesting idea. Are these the people that the Old Testament always refers to as the remnant, maybe? It would certainly be a part, yeah, the part of the remnant, but it would be those that are alive at the time. Okay. Because if they had if they had already died, they're just awaiting the resurrection. Okay, got gotcha. you. Um, but these are those that are actually alive. And my point is here, um, Simeon would certainly be one of those people. He was waiting for Joseph of Arimathea, one of those people waiting for the kingdom to come. They're already in covenant, and they see Jesus. And they're like, I can't believe it. I'm alive to see this. Those people are transferred. All that the Father has given me, I will no wise cast out. It's like the Son is now the one. You have to be in covenant with Him. So there's this generation that's alive during the transfer uh, from the Father to the Son. So it's kind of an important um, concept. Then. So my point is in verse number four, there's two kinds of people. They're both waiting for the Messiah. One is trying to kill him and kill anybody that's associated with him. But then there's other that are in covenant waiting for him. that They couldn't be more excited to see him. So there's turmoil. Verse number five. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up into God and to his throne. Interesting story here, because remember in act number two, we're focusing on the bride. 
This is not the story of the the, of the bridegroom. That was in Act Number One, chapters uh, one through eleven. So interestingly, you talk about going and rushing through a story. This is such a fascinating verse, folks. Do you see in verse number five? It's the entire ministry of Jesus from his birth in Bethlehem to his ascension in Acts chapter one. All of that takes place in one verse. So we're saving you some time here. Talk about speed reading. In one verse, we have Jesus' birth, his entire ministry, his death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension in one verse. Look what it says. And she brought forth a man child, that is, those in covenant brought forth Jesus, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child, that is Jesus, was caught up into God, that's his ascension, into his throne. There's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 in one verse. So uh, let's go ahead and look at Psalm chapter 2, or it's Psalm 2, you'd say, not chapter. The second Psalm, verses 7 through 9. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So you see in there this rod of iron idea, this is what's this is what's been prophesied the whole time, that God will through Christ the, the, the term here, heathens, for his inheritance, we see that again in Daniel chapter 7, um, that it's the Gentiles who will place their trust in Christ. It's the same reason he spoke in parables, to hide the kingdom from the, 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 the Gentiles so they would, essentially, so they would still kill him. That's Paul's argument in First Corinthians. If they knew that he was who he said he was, or if, he, if they knew who he was, they would never have crucified the king of glory is what Paul's argument is. And so the Gentiles needed Christ to be crucified so they can have a savior. And so he could be the one to inherit them. And of course, we see the great desire for the Gentiles to have him as Messiah. We see that with the, the Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15. Remember, the Canaanite, a Canaanite woman comes of, of the, um, the, the Grecian Phoenician, the Phoenician area, for the Syro Phoenician area, and she comes before Jesus and says, My daughter is tormented and needs to be healed. And Jesus completely ignores her, walks, walks away from her. And he says to the disciples in front of her, like she's kind of behind his back. And she, he says to the disciples that um, he's come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and ignores her. And she presses on and she says, I know that you can do this. My daughter needs you. I know that you can do this. He then says that you should not, you know, uh, uh, our, 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 okay. He says that the, the, the bread of the master um, should not be given to the dogs the chil children's bread should not be given to the dogs. The children is Israel. The bless in other words, the blessings of God came for the children of Israel, not to the dogs. Now, this is somebody he came to die for. And he's saying a cultural thing, saying, according to your guys' relationship, the blessings of the bread of heaven go to the children. And you're asking me to take the blessings from the children of Israel and give it to the dogs, the Canaanite woman. And you know what she says, Jimmy? She humbles herself, bows down before Christ and says, yes, but even a dog can sometimes get crumbs from the master's table. And he looks at her and says, oh, woman of great faith. What is going on? <laughs> Why wouldn't you just bless her and heal the kid? Yeah. It's because he was testing her faith. And he was acknowledging the great tension, political tension, social tension of the first century. And he basically was saying, you're a Gentile. This whole thing is for Jerusalem. This whole thing is for the Jews. And she's like, I know. Can I just get the outskirts of the blessing? He's like, you know, these people think you're dogs. I get that. But even a dog can have a crumb from the master's table. She is like, you cannot offend her. <laughs> she, is all, she is all in with Jesus. She's like, I know who you are. There's nothing you can say. I know how much you love me. I, it's like she was kind of saying, I get it. Do you, do you see the power? The Gentiles were ready to accept Jesus as king, like immediately. 
th- there is no problem for them because they didn't have the bondage of the traditions and the elder of the elders. They didn't have the feast days to work through. They didn't have all of that that baggage of of understanding all of this traditional culture of pointing towards Christ. They just saw him and said, "Oh, he's the Messiah. Psh, man, this is easy." So you couldn't offend her, mm-hmm. and so Jesus says, "Oh, woman of great faith," and heals. That's that's the whole point here. Is when it says the heathen for his inheritance. It's it's people like the the Canaanite woman that were just that was the inheritance of Jesus. He remember remember what this whole thing is to win the families of the earth. Abraham was blessed to be a blessing to the families of the earth in totality, all of them. Why? Because it's Genesis three fifteen. It's the story of the Bible. There's two lines: the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman will bring about the redeemer of all the world. That's, that's the whole point of the story. Okay, uh, let's go to Isaiah 11, 4. We've, we've, um, we could see the same thing in Psalm 110, but we have a whole video on that. So we'll just go to Isaiah 11, 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. All people, just to notice real quickly before we move on, how does he smite the earth? We're talking about a rod here in Revelation 12. How does Jesus smite the earth? It's a rod that comes out of his mouth. He smites the earth with his word. Jesus did not come to control everything by Uzis and bazookas and swords. Uh, Peter, put your sword away. You, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. We're not going to conquer the world with that. We're going to conquer the world with faith. We conquer the world through love and the grace of God and the mercy of God. Mm-hmm. So we see his sword comes out of his mouth, and it's through his word. So this is just a different way of conquering the world's not used to. Let's go to Revelation nineteen fifteen. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a the rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the rod of iron is the word of God. It's not military might. And so this is exactly why Moses got in so much trouble in the wilderness when he messed this picture up. Remember, they were dying of thirst in the wilderness, and they wanted some water. And the father said, hey, you see that rock over there? Go strike it, and and life-saving water will come out. So he strikes the rock, and water comes out. Well, it happens again, and he says, okay, speak to the rock and water will come out. And Moses strikes the rock, broke a picture. Paul says that rock symbolizes Christ, and that rock was Christ. So when Christ comes the first time through Bethlehem, he is smitten for us. He is struck, and from that striking of him, life-giving water comes out in the wilderness, and the world begins to reflourish, and there's a new creation from this new Adam and all of creation is starting over again. If I'm in Christ, I'm a new creature. But then when you see him come back in the story, we see him come back in revelation four. We see him come back as the, the lion and the lamb, a combination. He's not just a lamb in revelation. He's the lion and the lamb of the tribe of Judah. He's a combination. He's like a lamb as it were slain from the foundations of the world, but in a lion form. And no one's hitting him again, in other words. There's no second striking coming. And when you approach him now, you speak to him. Moses says to the Lord, we're dying of thirst first time. Okay, go strike the rock. Water will come out. Second time, we're dying of thirst. Okay, go speak to the rock. And that rock was Christ. Moses ruins the picture by striking the rock on the second time. Wasn't supposed to do that. They wandered for 40 years. The, yeah. the unbelieving generation dies off, okay? I thought so about that. All these things come together. I thought about that today because um, the psalm we read this morning was 106, and it's kind of oh, a okay. recap. Yeah. And there was a, one of the verses, it said that, um, because they provoked his spirit so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. <laughs> 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 I, was, I was imagining, I, I asked Missy, I said, I wonder if that means he's like started yelling at him, and then he struck that rock just because he was so, so angry. You know, he, so he had frustrated. enough. <laughs> so frustrated. I can't imagine the frustration that Moses felt. <laughs> I mean, absolutely unbelievable. That story Let's always makes me. 
That story always makes me sad for Moses. It really does. Oh man. I mean, he went through a lot and, and the, the imagery in Hebrews is that Jesus is the new Moses. And that's why we're going to see the, the Exodus motif so clearly through the book of Revelation, uh, primarily in act one, when we saw the, the plagues and the, the, the judgments going on, they mirrored that of what Moses went through. It's saying that Jesus is our, is the new Moses and that we are now going through a new sort of Exodus, not from Pharaoh, but from apostate Israel. And we're getting out of that. We're going into the new wilderness, the wilderness of Judea. It's the, the roles have been reversed. So that's why well, we have that powerful imagery. Well, yeah. And one more verse out of that uh, Psalm that we, we did today in, in verse 23, it says, Therefore he said that he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. And that's clearly what Jesus is for us. He he stands in the breach yeah. and turns away God's wrath from us. And I'm yeah. so grateful. One, yes. one, one for many. What an awesome yeah. idea of, of the substitutionary atonement for sure. Yeah. Let's go ahead and read verse number six. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, for they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Um, this is mirroring Matthew 24. So those of you who have been following us for a while and you went through all of the Matthew 24 study, you can see now, uh, I'm going to go back to one of the videos we did, Jimmy, that we called the Revelation, the dating game, which I love that name that you, such a creative name you gave it. <laughs> and, and, you know, when we were going through the proofs of the dating of Revelation, you know, it, it, I'll be honest, it was very hard for me to get into the mindset of proving the date. Because now if you've been with us this whole time and you're at chapter 12 and you've been going the whole time with us in order, you can see now that the dating of Revelation can be easily understood by its paralleled content to Jesus' ministry. Right. I mean, it's, it's almost like, and I, I'm not saying that I don't look down on anybody if they're learning. I don't mean that. But I mean, if people that have been studying this that would disagree with us, and they say, oh, well, I think it was written in the 90s under the reign of Domitian or something like that. To me, Jimmy, I almost have to have patience and step back and say, if we're talking to a pastor or a teacher or something like that, and I'm thinking to myself, have you read it? Yeah. Revelation is about the ministry of Christ. And was, you know, to me, dating the book of Revelation is as simple as understanding Matthew 24. If yeah. you believe Matthew 24, as we stated it, then Revelation follows suit. It's the same content. And so here's another example where I just scratch my head and I'm wondering, do they think it all happens twice? Like, you know, I mean, by what authority can you just say that? This is all the same stuff. So we're going to read verse six again. It says, the woman, that's those that are in covenant with God, the woman, This, by the way, let me also say this. This is after the ascension of Christ in verse five. So Acts chapter one, he ascends into heaven to the father. Then we have 40 years of ministry in the book of Acts. Then at the end of the book of Acts, we're preparing for the great tribulation. And then in verse number six, the woman, those that are in covenant, fled to the wilderness. Exactly what Jesus says to do in Matthew 24. They leave Jerusalem. You know, the Romans are coming down for war, the Roman Jewish war. The Romans are coming down. When they start to surround Jerusalem, the Christians all go, hey, this is the time we're supposed to leave. And they all go to the wilderness. This is what it's referencing. It's the same thing. Where she, that's the woman, where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there. Now look at this, Jimmy, 1,260 or three score days. Now, if you divide that number, 1260, by 360, remember, don't go 365 because the Hebrew days were 360, then it's three and a half. So this is talking about three and a half years right here. Yeah. The exact same length of time the Great Tribulation was said to be. There is no number seven years in the book of Revelation. Mm -mm. So the futurists who really want to have Daniel's 70th week be in Revelation, I got bad news for them. There is no seven-year period of tribulation or seven years of Daniel's final week and then three and a half are bad. 
uh, I'll tell you how they get that, Jimmy, is they say, well, because it's so clearly three and a half. It's stated three and a half over and over again. And they actually use that right there. And they say, aha, but if you put two of those three and a half together, you have our seven. And so to my, this is what I always ask them. I say, okay, so you're taking a three and a half from over here and a three and a half from over here, and that's how you're getting your seven? And they say yes to that. Here's the problem with that. Three and a half is mentioned five times in Revelation. So if you're going to do that hermeneutic and be consistent, you come out to 17 and a half years, not seven years. You have yeah. two and a half units of seven. Uh, so you can't, you can't piecemeal your doctrine together. You can't say, well, it's, it's over here. No, it's said five times that the tribulation is three and a half years. You can't add just two of those together to, to cram and shoehorn your belief of Daniel 9 and say, we believe this is the last week of Daniel. No, please. That's, uh, it's to the point of lunacy at that point. That is not how we do Bible study. We go in order and we look at the author's flow of thought. And I think any fair-minded minded person can say that we're going through the author's flow of thought here, which is very simple. I'm just going to read what we have so far. We have a wonder in heaven, a woman who is now exalted with the presence of God. The feast days and all of the ceremonial days are under her feet. We have then that there is a, a, a war going on where the dragon is trying to make sure that this, there is no uh, birth coming from this woman. There's a mixture of people who listen and don't listen. We have finally a birth that happens and the child is delivered. The child lives and is going to rule the nations with the rod of iron and then ascends into heaven after that time. The woman then hightails it to the wilderness where God is prepared for her to, to take care of her for three and a half years. That's verses one through six. To piecemeal that out and to say, well, I'm going to take out just this part of the verse and I'm going to take out this part of that verse and aha, seven year tribulation is not Bible study. That is indoctrination. Okay. So if you just read this in order, you get to what we're saying. That's my opinion. I, I'm much more comfortable with Scripture interpreting itself than me trying to to <laughs> to come up with. Yeah. Well, yeah. this must be so we can do this. This has to be this or that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm much more yeah. comfortable with Scripture saying. It. Yeah, just let it speak for itself. And yeah. if you don't have a dog in the fight, this really isn't that hard. If you do have a dog in the fight, it gets very complex. Mm -hmm. And so that's why if you have a preconceived idea of what this should say. And you have a lot of work to do to try and make it all fit your idea. If you just read it in order like we are and just understand what it's saying, it's really not a complicated document. I'm going to read to you a quote from David Chilton. He says, concerning this in verse number six, as will become apparent below, speaking of verse six, the woman's flight into the wilderness is a picture of the flight of the Judean Christians from the destruction of Jerusalem. So that the dragon's wrath is expended upon apostate rather than faithful Israel. While she is in the wilderness, the woman is nourished for 1260 days. So that's where we get to in verse number six. Remember, this is the story of the bride. And so that's why we're going kind of quickly through everything else. 